I'm the Watchman, and this, I know I'm doing a series on Satan's lie that shook up Christianity, and I'm going to get back to that, but I just found out some news that happened last month, you know, that I had to share because it has biblical proportions, biblical proportions, and I'm just finding this out, you know, I'm just finding this out, and I don't watch much, I don't watch TV at all. And, you know, and I, I haven't been checking the news sites on online. So, of course, you know, y'all might have already heard about this and y'all might not have. But I want to show how the news I just found out actually fulfills or is a part of a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Now, before I, before I get into it and actually tell you what the news is, you know, the thing about the, the Bible, which is so wonderful, God will have a scenario or he'll say something or, you know, or a piece of prophecy. And God uses a lot of times what we call type and anti-type, you know, and that's what we have here. Something Jesus prophesied and it came, it already came to be, but it also had a anti-type or a type, it had an anti-type for our day and time, for the last days. So not only did... It, it prophesied and it came to be, but it also stood for something that would happen later on in in these last days. Later on in these last days. And that's the type. The type already happened. And the anti-type is what would happen later on. The same thing. It's basically God, like, how should I put it? God using, uh, basically it's like one scenario happening twice. In different time periods and beloved that is the abomination of desolation the abomination of desolation turning your Bibles with me to Matthew 24 Matthew 24 and I'm gonna read verse 15 
Matthew 24, verse 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. The reason why, why I'm saying this is because on February 1st, Israel signed a deal with the Vatican, an agreement with the Vatican, in giving the Pope a seat in what is considered the upper room. The upper room sits on top of King David's tomb. And the upper room is supposed to be the place where Jesus and the disciples had the Last Supper. They actually gave the Pope a seat in this very room. <laughs> Can you imagine? It, it is a sign. And not only did they give him a seat of authority in this room, they also have some authority over this actual site. So this is as we, as what we would call this. We're, we're talking about the the the, the religion that actually, you know, murdered and killed over 50 million Christians. You know, we're talking about the religion that if you had a Bible, you were burned and killed. Killed reformers like Huss, Wycliffe. Well, they didn't even kill Wycliffe. They were so mad that, they, that he had a stroke and died before they killed him that they dug up his bones, burned him, and then cast his ashes into the sea. This is that same entity. They now... On February 1st, Israel signed an agreement to let the Pope have a seat in the upper room. What I read in Matthew 24 is Jesus talking about the last days. What was the abomination of desolation? Remember what I said, type is the first time it happens. The anti-type is what you could say the second time. That's my easiest way to explain type and anti-type. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15, what we just read, it says, When ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then he says in verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, the first time that this was fulfilled was in A.D. 70. A.D. 70. And that is when Rome... When Rome, under the the uh, under General Titus and his dad Vespasian, is that how you pronounce it, Vespasius or Vespasian? But anyway, it was under Titus. We'll just tell about his son, General Titus. Vespasian first they they came and they besieged Rome. They besieged Rome, but then after they besieged Rome, and that was them planting on holy ground. They were on holy ground. That's why when Jesus said, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So you had paganism. At this time, Rome was not converted, and it still really isn't. But you had paganism standing on holy ground. So Rome, besieged, Rome besieges Jerusalem, and then they turn around and they leave. And when they leave, Israel thinks they're leaving because of them. They run behind and, you know, they run, you know, Israel's army runs behind them while while the Romans army is pulling away. And they, you know, they fight them a little bit, you know, acting like they're kicking them out. Yeah, go ahead, get out of here, you know. And, and th there's rejoicing. But the Christians who were in Jerusalem at this time in AD 7 well this was actually AD 67 in AD 67 the Christians who were in Jerusalem at the time remembered what Jesus had said and so they got out of there they immediately fled once the Roman army first the Roman army besieged Jerusalem that was the abomination of desolation the abomination of desolation and once they turned around and left all the Christians who remembered what Jesus said, they got out of Jerusalem and they fled to the mountains and other and other parts of the world. They fled. And the Roman army was gone for three years, I believe three and a half years. And then they, and Israel thought, oh, we beat them. We whooped Rome. And then they came back. And that is when General Titus came back in A.D. 70. And that is when Jerusalem was overthrown and burned to the ground and the people were killed sold in slavery taken captive 
they were, you know, it was horrible things going on in Jerusalem at the time. That was the type. This is the anti-type. See, Jesus was warning when he said, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, when you shall see Rome come and sit in holy ground, is that not what just happened in this signed agreement? Rome has now has a seat in holy ground. And, and, and above King David's tomb, can you imagine pagan Rome? Let's see what Daniel goes into this prophecy a little deeper in exposing, dealing with this abomination of desolation. And there's several verses I want to read that pinpoint Rome as the abomination of desolation. Turn to Daniel chapter 11. Go to Daniel chapter 11. And he's talking about the king of the north. The king of the north who causes, who is this abomination? Who is this abomination? I want to re read some verses that describe this king. Daniel 11 verse 27 says, And both these kings, talking about the king of the north and the king of the south. And he says, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. And they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at a time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against, against the holy covenant. Has not Rome shown that they do not love Christianity at all? Even though these past couple hundred years, even though these past couple hundred years, they've been silent and have it been burning and killing people but let's not forget our history which 99 percent of the known world has we've forgotten our history and what's the saying he who forgets his history is doomed to repeat it it's doomed to repeat it but verse 28 then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits. That word exploits mean to do works and return to his own land. Now it actually mentions the abomination of desolation. This is where Daniel actually calls him, lets you know who the abomination of desolation is. Is Verse 31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary. They shall pollute what? They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. The abomination that maketh desolate. Verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits and shall do works the work they need to be done and they that understand among the people shall instruct many you're gonna have your watchmen yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days there is a time of trouble coming but daniel says it let's get right to it mm -hmm. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping, which means they shall be helped with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. See how this keeps talking about the time of the end? Verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself. Now you know we're talking about the pope. We're talking about the Pope. This is where Daniel describes the Pope even a little deeper. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. When the Pope can tell people, I am the vicar of Christ. I am the mediator for mankind. He's talking about that he's He's on the same level as Jesus. When he says he can forgive sins, only God can forgive sins. If that's not speaking great words against God, here the Pope, excuse my honesty, but he's a regular man like me. He uses the bathroom. He's He passes gas. He's talking about he can forgive sins. 
If this is not speaking great things against God, let's keep going. He even has a throne in this sanctuary. If you look at the Catholic cathedral that the Pope sits in, he has a throne in his sanctuary. If he's not, if that is not speaking great things against God, putting his throne in God's sanctuary. Remember in verse 31, it says, and they shall pollute the sanctuary. And they, and they even have confessional booths in the sanctuary. But anyway, where was that? Okay. Verse 36. And he shall magnify himself above every God. And I'm in Daniel 11, verse 36. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that it is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Now, this is definitely how you know it's the Pope. Do Are the popes and bishops supposed to marry? No. They're supposed to claim a life of celibacy. And right here, verse 37 says, Now, how many religious leaders claim lives of celib other than the Pope? Could it be because they've taken this traditional union that God has set up. God has said, be fruitful and multiply. But but they've chose to say, no, we're going to be celibate and we're not going to have any women. Could that be why they're, they're running around touching so many young boys? You know, because they're, 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 they're blocking their natural affection. But anyway, it's the popes and the bishops and nuns who prove lives of celibacy. So right here, when he says he he will not have the desire of women, this is the Pope, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Look at verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. He's going to be violent. If they haven't proved that already, you know, Google for, you know, it kills me when, when people say, no, the, the Catholic Church hasn't uh, ever persecuted anyone. It's like, what? Who do you think the pilgrims were running from who founded America? They were just running over here to run? No, they were seeking religious freedom, you know, because they, to stop the Roman persecution and the Spanish Inquisition that killed millions. Google it. It's right there. All everything you need to know is right, right, right at your fingertips. But anyway, let's 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 get some more verses. This matter of fact, I'm gonna skip down. Read Daniel eleven. Read Daniel eleven. But look at Daniel twelve. Now, now he's telling us God is telling us this, right? But Daniel twelve one is the shocker. Daniel twelve one is the shocker, and it says, "And at that time shall Michael stand up." The great prince which standeth for the children of our people. Now, now people be debating whether this is Jesus or not. And I'm not going to get into it right now because it's easy to prove that, that Michael and Jesus is the same person. You know, it's, especially when it says, and I believe it's, it's 2 Thessalonians or 2 Timothy, which says, And Jesus shall come with the voice of the archangel. You know, he doesn't borrow Michael's voice when he comes again. He doesn't say, uh, Michael, can I borrow your voice? No, it is. He is Michael. It, Mikey Al. You know, just because we, in our human language, call him Jesus, how do we know in heaven they don't call him Mikey Al? Hmm? We're so low base in our reasoning sometimes. You know, we call him Jesus. That is his name. That is his earthly, blessed, holy name. But in heaven, you know, it could be Mikey L. But anyway, as we see, and let me just say this on that point. It says, Michael shall, Michael shall Michael stand up, the great prince with standing for the children of our people. Is there another great prince in heaven? No, I only know of one great prince, and that is my King Christ. So I believe it's clearly right here that Mikey L. And Christ is the same person. You know, like when Jesus said, Jesus is coming back for his children, you know, as a lion. You know, he left as a lamb and he's coming back as a lion. And then verse 12 says, and at that time shall Michael, Michael, stand up the great prince. There's only one great prince I know in heaven. Anyway, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. But this is the part. 
and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And he's talking about what is to come. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book of life. And this is talking about after judgment. It just mentions the book of life. So this 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 hasn't even come yet. This is this is about to come. Now, do you see Daniel has said right when we see the abomination of desolation, then he describes the Pope and he describes Rome. Even in verse 38, it talks about all of their precious stones, gold and silver. You know, that's all you see with the Pope and them is gold and, you know, silver. But then right here, Daniel 12, 1, he says, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And there have been some horrible times in history. The Holocaust. You know, you can just go back to Holocaust, the 20 million uh, African slaves that were that died. And, you know, slavery just throughout all history, not just in America, but we're talking about everywhere. There's been slaves everywhere, but there have been there have been horrible times and people being killed. Like in the Congo, you know, several years ago, where over two million were killed in genocide by militias. You know, there have been some horrible times. And yet Daniel tells us when we see the abomination of desolation, there is going to be a time of trouble like never was. So what I'm stressing to you people, beloved, the reason I had to make this is because time is short. Time is short. Get right now. Draw closer to Jesus now. The only way you'll be saved is if you're abiding in Christ. The things of this world mean little when it comes to your soul salvation. I heard a preacher say one time, don't trust just don't leave your salvation, your soul salvation in the hands of any man. It's sad when I see people who don't study and read for themselves, who, who, who were so blinded by the entertainment of the world that we're not seeing clearly the times. The Bible is clear and is simple. In his prophecies and his warnings, God is so great that he's warning us with several warnings. Jesus, in Matthew 24, 15, what we read at the beginning, where it says, And Jesus said, And we ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Jesus is saying, stay in the sanctuary. The holy place in the sanctuary contains the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the seven-branch candlestick. So what Jesus is basically saying when he says stand in the holy place, when you see these things, he's saying read your Bible, because that's what the table of showbread means. He says stay in your Bible. The altar of incense stands for prayer. He says stay in your Bible, stay on your knees, and be a light to others. So when Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, he's, and he says, stand in the holy place. What he is saying is, get, stay in your Bibles, stay on your knees in communication and prayer to, to the Lord, and be a light to others. That is our only safety. That is our only safety. And beloved, be honest, be honest. Many of us aren't in our Bibles. I'm not talking about five minutes. I'm talking about be honest with yourself. If if your TV time, which you can watch TV throughout the whole day for like five hours. If that is quadruple your Bible time, there's an issue. There's an issue. If your Bible time really isn't at all, if you feel like you can go throughout the day, well, I'll read my Bible tomorrow. I'm, I'm being honest. Most of us don't crack our Bibles open, period. Period. We love to hear about last days. We love to hear about the end times. We love to hear about Illuminati. All these things. And I'm a firm teacher and believe of all these things. But beloved, it means nothing if you're not getting drawing close to Jesus. It means nothing to know these things. It means nothing to see the enemy at work. 
It means nothing to see the devil in hip hop, the devil in music, the devil in the movies, the devil in in our cartoons. It means nothing to see Satanism, you know, in our government. You know, it means nothing to see Lucifer's Trust, which used to be Lucifer's publishing, in our United Nations building. You know, all our leaders are studying up under Alice A. Bailey, uh, a, a well-known satanic prophetess who didn't hide it, who studied under Madame Blavatsky. It means nothing to know all of these things if you don't know Jesus for yourself. Take heed, beloved. For Jesus said, I am coming as a thief. You don't know when a thief is coming. If you did, if you knew when a thief was coming, you would be able to stop him. But what's sad is many, only a small number is going to be saved. And that includes myself. I could be lost. I could warn you today and lose my soul tomorrow. <laughs> this is not a game. These are enemies are not playing and and what's so crazy is is that prophecy is fulfilling itself right in front of us type and anti-type i'm gonna read you before i close i'm gonna read you something off the uh jewish website about what happened it says ongoing deputy foreign minister and i have this link in this description this is outgoing deputy foreign minister danny ayalon is leaving his mark on jerusalem after years of negotiations with the Vatican over property and tax issues, it seems that a historic breakthrough is near. Headlines in the Jerusalem Post announce Jerusalem is on the verge of signing agreement to formalize diplomatic relations with the Holy See. They signed it just a couple days after this article was issued. However, there are conflicting and disturbing reports regarding the status of the Last Supper Room, also referred to as the Upper Room. Cynical shrine, which sits above the traditional tomb of King David and is a century part of the diaspora yeshiva grounds on Mount Zion. For many years, the Catholic Church has been vying for ownership of the room, which is considered by many Christians to be the traditional site of the location of the Last Supper. The room itself is a 12th century crusader structure built on top of the traditional tomb of King David. Whereas the Jerusalem Post claims that the two sides have essentially decided to agree to disagree on the matter, Israel Hayamon is reporting that the agreement will grant the Pope an official seat in the upper room as well as giving the Vatican a special modicum of control over the site. So Pope Francis, the new Pope, that had a little bit to play with them forcing Benedict to resign. Anyway, Pope Francis, the first ever Jesuit slash Pope, the first black and white Pope, because the Jesuit, you know, the Jesuit Pope, the black Pope was black, but the first ever, not black skin, but they considered him the black Pope. And the Jesuits are like the pit bull. Did you know, just a side note, that the Jesuits were created to stop out Protestantism? That is why they were created by Ignatius Loyola. That's a whole nother video. But anyway, Pope Francis has a seat in holy ground. Right above King David's tomb. The abomination of desolation. Take heed, beloved. God bless.